Hello, everyone. Hello, dear speakers, dear participants. Thank you for joining for this new session uh, of the Africa Salon. Um, before uh, giving the floor to uh, Cedric uh, to introduce his speakers, uh, I would like, uh, uh, in addition to thanking you for being here, to make a small introduction about the Africa Salon, but also the Africa Network and IFRAN Forum. This is an initiative uh, that we have launched in 2016, uh, uh, a network of uh, uh, men and women from Africa, uh, economic operators, uh, political decision makers, uh, but also people who would like to work for the welfare of the continent. Uh, today, the network counts more than 1,000 members, all uh, managing companies from uh, 30 uh, countries from the continent. Our objectives is, uh, objective is to showcase the importance of the private sector in the welfare of the continent. Uh, uh, Africa uh, Network is committed to a prosper Africa, and this is uh, how uh, what guides our action every day. Our main event is IFRAN Forum. This is a yearly event that we organize in IFRAN, a small town in Morocco, gathering about 200 people coming from different countries from the continent uh, to discuss, to share ideas, but most important, importantly, to act for a better continent for all of us. Um, uh, EAFRICA Salon is an initiative that we launched a few months ago. We could not gather, unfortunately, during this year because of the pandemic, but we uh, had to maintain the connection between all of us, and this space was created for this. We have already organized two sessions. This is the third one that we are living, and we will conclude with the fourth one by the end of January. All the recommendations that will come out uh, from these sessions will be consolidated in a document that will be shared not only with our members, but also with institutions we think they might play a good and important role in implementing uh, uh, these recommendations. I will not be too long. I would like to say again, thank you uh, for, your, for the speakers, for joining us. Thank you for the participants. And uh, thank you, Cedric, uh, uh, for accepting to be our moderator uh, for this session. I hand it to you to introduce your guests and to start uh, the discussion. Thank you, Cedric. You're welcome. It's a with pleasure, uh, Khadija. So, hello, everybody. Uh, once more, thank you for joining us. So, welcome to this third edition of uh, iAfrica Salon. As uh, Khadija said, my name is Cedric. I'm the chairman of uh, the London-based Congolese Chamber of Commerce in Great Britain, CCCGB. We bridge the Congo and the rest of the world in trade, business, and investment. I am also a member of uh, iAfrica Advisory Boards, and today I'm the moderator of our discussion on a very interesting topic, which is East Africa post COVID-19, leveraging industry to absorb the crisis effect. Currently, it's not possible not to mention the current pandemic and its adverse consequences in any, in any discussion. But here for the next 45 minutes or so, we want to focus on how uh, industrialization can help alleviate the impact of COVID-19 in the East Africa region. Just to remind ourselves, uh, East Africa is composed of the following countries. We have Burundi, Comoros, Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Madagascar, Rwanda, Seychelles, Somalia, Tanzania, South Sudan, and Uganda. For that, I have two guests, uh, Mr. Amin Idris Adum, who is the Director of Program and Delivery of the African Union Development Agency, or AUDA NEPAD, uh, based in South Africa. We, we also have Mr. Henri Nyakarundi, he's the CEO of African Renewable Energy Distributor Group, ARED in short, based in Rwanda. And uh, unfortunately, our third guest, Mr. Nicolas Kilimani, could not join us from Uganda due to unforeseen circumstances. Before I go to the questions, I would like to kind of invite our guests to introduce themselves with a very short bio. So, Mr. Nya Karundi, can you start, please? Yes. Um, thank you, Cedric. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great. 
Uh, yeah, briefly. So as you mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Henry. I'm from Rwanda. So uh, basically, uh, you know, I've been in business for, for 20 plus years. I've done most of my business experience in the States and I moved to uh, back to Rwanda in 2013 to start A-Red. Uh, I guess we'll talk more about it, but that's pretty much my uh, background. Thank you very much, Henry. And uh, Amin, please. Thank you. And uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Obviously, my name is Amin, and I do coordinate the role, the, the, the job. I do coordinate the Directorate of uh, Program Delivery and Coordination at the African Union Development uh, Agency, where I think I've been for the last two years. And before that, I was at the African Union Commission, but before that, 15 years, uh, spent 15 years in the private sector. Thanks. All across Africa and in the world. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, to all the participants, please note that you will have the opportunity to send your questions via the chat uh, facility during the Q&A session at the end of our discussions. Uh, my first question goes to Mr. Adum, I mean, uh, East Africa has been the fastest growing region in Africa with above 5% of economic growth every year but now the projections are at 1.2% and even 0.2% the worst case scenario. Could you please comment on the state of play? Thank you. Actually, the situation in East Africa is not really different from the situation of the other regions uh, in the continent. In West Africa, you do have a similar uh, status. Central Africa, Southern Africa, but also uh, North uh, Africa, actually. So it's not really different. And it's mostly due to the COVID. The COVID actually uh, pandemic that have uh, deeply, uh, deeply disturbed the global uh, supply chain. Most of our African countries being actually exporters, uh, exporters of raw materials, but also agricultural uh, products have been uh, quite uh, impacted by that one. So East Africa case is not really uh, different. Uh, beside uh, the, the, the COVID, I, I do think as well, the fact that at the international, uh, the international actually uh, situation uh, that was coming just before uh, the COVID where countries and especially the US and uh, China, uh, but also Latin America, they were into a kind of a trade war Actually, that have as well may have as well had an impact on the economy of this uh, region. Remember that uh, East Africa, uh, usually, especially countries that are on the coast, uh, being uh, Kenya or uh, Tanzania or uh, Djibouti, you know, they do not just depend on the export. They depend as well on the the, the supply chain uh, road. The fact that most of the imports to the other countries are passing through those countries. And when you close borders, definitely, you know, not only you impact negatively your economy, but you start as well having a very bad impact on your companies, the companies operating there. So it's not a unique case, it's the case for the entire continent, I would say. But now that we are thinking about vaccine and we have managed at least at this continent, you know, to minimize the health impact of, of the COVID, I think there are ways to get out of this situation. We'll talk about that later. Thanks. Thank you, Amin, for your interesting point. Uh, now a question to uh, Henri. Uh, what gaps COVID-19 has put the lights on for East Africa in particular? And what can be done to move forward and to really strengthen our core business and other sectors? Yeah, so I, I, I'll talk on a, on a more specific, at least for ARED and, and, and also a little bit on the general uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, but for us, I think I mean, um, mention a little bit. So we are a hardware and software company. We have a physical products and a software company. So supply, supply chain really mess, really disrupt that uh, uh, our supply chain COVID, you know, because most of the manufacturing we do is in, uh, is in Asia. Um, which is unfortunate, but the reality is that um, we still have huge gap in, in, in manufacturing industry in Africa. And it's not just the manufacturing industry gaps, but also the taxation system where we tax on components. Uh, if you want to assemble your, your products, 
but you get some exempt, exemption if you bring a, a full assembled products, which is another discussion. But the, the, the biggest gap for us was the supply chain. The second gap, as you can see, is connectivity. Um, as you can see now, COVID has shut down a lot of uh, uh, our ways of, of, of traveling and meeting clients and, and, and stuff like that. I mean, we operate in full market. Now we, got, we have to do everything online. And connectivity is now is key. So if you have bad connection or if you have a, uh, if you have a high cost of internet, that can be very problematic uh, in certain areas. Now, of course, it varies from countries uh, uh, to countries. But I think the biggest gap, which is not an effect on us, but I, I believe is the health sector. I mean, I, I think it's, 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 and just to be light on what I'm about to say, because uh, I think it, it's a shame that we as a continent are unable to develop our own vaccine. And we're waiting for uh, the world now to give us the vaccine, you know, for, for this COVID, which is embarrassing to me, you know, um, and that's a huge gap. The health sector in Africa is, is it's, it's problematic. Thank God that COVID did not have the huge impact on the other continent. But I think those are, for me, at least personally, those are the huge gap that needs to be uh, fulfilled. And, uh, and I really hope, you know, things will move faster um, on those gaps. Yeah, thank you very much, Henry, for these uh, yeah, particular uh, points. Uh, just let me, let me go back to Mr. Adum. As uh, director of an economic development program at the African Union, when you hear uh, Henry talking about those gaps, uh, what is your organization doing to bring solutions? In fact, at uh, Odenipat last year, 2020, we, had, we, we have actually had to reprioritize the way we were working and especially reprioritize actually all our programs. Number one, to combat the COVID and to, that was done through direct support to the Africa CDC, financial support, but also technical uh, support. Uh, number two, to work as well with uh, the African pharmaceutical uh, sectors uh, to, to, to start actually an initiative about a vaccine coming from uh, Africa. As you know, we have the AMRH, which is the African Medicine Harmonization uh, Agreement, actually, uh, with the AMA, which is the African Medicine uh, Agency, which is supposed to be based by the way, Rwanda, hopefully very soon. No. So we had to refocus our efforts actually toward that one. And then number three, uh, COVID is not just a health, uh, I would say, pandemic. It is also a pandemic that, because it has interrupted the global, disturbed the global supply chain, it has as well had a lot of impact on, on the food. Access to food was quite an issue. And we had to work with our member states to address the issue of the access to food. Uh, many African countries, at least 10, were actually under very high and very terrible pressure you know, of risk of famine. So we have had to provide as well support to that. Now, globally speaking, not globally, uh, the continent speaking, we did not just try to address the issue of the COVID. We do as well work with our partners and the countries to plan you know, the post-COVID. And the post-COVID, actually, which is the work we are doing right now, we could only address the, the challenges that Africa is facing for the post-COVID through uh, three actions. Number one, invest more in the private sector. And the private sector for us means uh, micro, medium, micro, small and medium enterprises. You know, in, in this continent, MSMEs, as we call them, they account for 360 million jobs in the continent. You know? And if you compare uh, the jobs that are created by governments. Uh, all governments remitted in the continent have created about 60 million jobs. Big companies, meaning uh, companies that have over 100 people, if you put all of them together in the continent, they have uh, created about 66 million jobs. That means that micro, small, and medium enterprises, they have created more than three times the total number of jobs created by governments and multinationals in the continent. So solution actually is within MSMEs, that's number one. So we have put a lot of effort trying to address the issues of uh, MSMEs. MSMEs basically face three types of issues. 
access to capacity, capabilities, access to financing, and access to market. So those are the three uh, solutions that we are right now providing through one of our initiatives. Number two, as a development agency, we do also believe that solution for Africa for to, to build better resilience toward any other pandemic or crisis will go necessarily through more technology. So more technology means digitization. For us, it's an absolute necessity for Africa to invest more. That means uh, improving our regulatory framework today, it does not, we talk about uh, innovation, but when you look at actually our regulatory frameworks and the way our governments actually handle this, doesn't sound like we are really pushing toward more uh, innovation in this uh, sector. And Henry have been spoken, uh, talking about the case, the example of taxes, you know, so that's number. And then uh, number two, uh, obviously, investing into uh, primary health care. You know, you can't really, uh, Addressing the COVID pandemic is one thing, but preparing for future crises actually will go, especially health crisis, will go only through a much better improvement of our primary health care systems, primary health care. And then uh, obviously, I will not forget uh, to talk about the fact that we need now to really push uh, toward implementing, accelerating the implementation of the ACFT, Africa Continental Free Trade Area. But for us to really tap into the opportunities that will come with the SEFG, we need as well to invest more into industrialization. And I'll come back to the industrialization later. So that's what we are doing uh, right now at the policy level with the African Union Commission, because this is the political organization, the political uh, hand of the African Union. We, we are the development agency, so we do provide support and expertise for them to develop the policies. And at the implementation level, this is where we do intervene with every country, but also at the level of the regional economic communities, but also, I would say, at the level of regional agencies or private sector organizations. Oh, thank you. It's good to learn that there are initiatives and solutions in place uh, to tackle the effect of COVID-19. But in every crisis, there are opportunities. And I would like to ask Mr. Nyakarundi, uh, Henry, what industry COVID-19 has impacted positively and how do business models have to be changed? What need to be resolved to be to go beyond post-COVID era? Yeah, so the, on, a, on, a, on a tech space, I mean, tech really benefited from uh, COVID on communication, uh, tech that deal with communication or online and really bad uh, delivery, delivery pro, I mean, delivery companies that deal with logistics since uh, a lot of people were confined to their home, really benefited from uh, 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 COVID e-commerce basically top of business really benefited from um, from covid but it, it's really tech centric so so basically any any technology that bridged the the, the gap between the, the the consumer and and the company without having to have a face-to-face -face, uh interaction so uh those are the gap but unfortunately except e-commerce and to, to a certain extent a lot of those technology are foreign technology. When I mean foreign, they're owned by companies outside the continent. So it's not really benefiting uh, African companies uh, in, in, in a bigger extent. Um, and there's a lot more to be done uh, on, for, you know, uh, to, to be honest with you, there's a lot more funding needed in those tech company because this is the biggest gap, you know, uh, how to bring the tech economy of African entrepreneur to the forefront. I think those are the, the, the biggest things that needs to be addressed and solved. But other than that, I mean, tech is gonna play a much bigger role. And I, I think with this COVID, uh, whether it's the private sector or the public sector, actually sees it. Now the question is, who's gonna win this race? Uh, that's, that's the question I'm also wondering, but we'll see. We'll see how what happens. Okay, thank you for, for this insight. As you are on the ground, so you know exactly <laughs> what you are talking about. And uh, just on a, on a, on a more ge general uh, point of view, uh, the lockdown measures have come at a cost for the economy of every, con of every country, even in East Africa. 
for example, decrease of external trade, uh, disruptions in tourism and services, especially in East Africa, uh, inflation, inflationary pressure, uh, more than 16% is predicted in 2021. Uh, the question is, would, for example, diversification, the structural transformation be part of the region COVID-19 response? Uh, to make the region's economy less vulnerable to external crisis and reduce poverty in a sustainable manner, Mr. Adam? I think, you know, we, we've been talking uh, in this continent and not just for East Africa, but for the, all the regions. For years, we've been talking about uh, diversification. But you don't see that happening actually at the ground. Uh, level. There may be some uh, reason, bec maybe because countries are quite comfortable with the way things actually are going. They prefer just to be raw materials producers. Uh, but, but the world is changing and Africa is changing first. Number one, our demography is no longer the same. Like 60 years ago, uh, African continent was, the, the population of the entire continent was less than 300 million. You know, right now we are about, that was less than 200 million in 1959, 1960. Right now we are 1.3, 1.4 uh, billion. That's number one. Number two, our continent have been as well urbanizing very fast. We used to be very rural uh, continent. Right now, I think experts are predicting that by 2050, about 65 to 70% of all African citizens will be living in cities. You know? So we can't just continue to be producing raw materials or saying that we must invest into uh, just actually send people back to the rural area and work in agriculture. In fact, it's even a mistake to say that we need to use agriculture to employ our people. And if you look at actually developed countries, when a country have a big number of people working in agriculture, let's take Ethiopia, 80% of uh, its citizens are actually employed by agriculture. But then you can see that the, 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 the yield, but also the performance of the agriculture sector is not at the level that actually uh, agriculture in Ethiopia and made in Ethiopia can even feed Ethiopian people. So the more people you have in your agriculture, the less productive and performance you are, I would say. There is maybe no causality, but we can observe this uh, correlation. So what means diversification? Diversification will happen only and only if we decide, number one, to massively invest into creating an environment that will allow private sector to function properly, which is not the case today. If you look at actually doing business uh, from the World Bank, I think few countries in Africa are quite well, like Rwanda, Mauritius, you know, but the majority of our countries are lagging behind. That means our environment, you know, being the legal environment or the business environment, generally speaking, is not con conducive. So you can't actually talk about diversification unless you have improved your doing business, your business environment. Now, if you do so, if you do that already, what means diversification? The world, uh, uh, now we are all talking about industrialization, but here again, if you look at actually at every country, you hardly find an industrialization policy at the country level. Even at the continental level, we used to have the IDA, I think the African uh, kind of policy that was developed by the African Union Commission and the NEPAD at the time, 15 years ago, that speak about how we can push the industrialization. It's a few number of very, less than 10, 15 pages, that's not an industrialization policy. And that's the reason why other NEPAT have organized it with the African Union Commission, but also the UNECA and the UNIDO last year in December at the industrialization week, just to start thinking about how we can really go through diversification by investing more into industrialization. But industrialization means first we need to address the issue of the business environment. That one is fundamental. If without addressing the challenges of the business environment, you can't actually even think to industrialize yourself. Industrializing how? Those who are supposed to push the industrialization are the private sector, small, medium enterprises, you know? So you need to make their life easier. For, for me, it's the fundamental question. What I'm telling to people when they ask me this question about diversification, I say, let's address the issue of business environment first. Let's make it clean, you know? 
When you make it clean, you don't need to say, I'm going to industrialize. Private sector will do it for you because the environment is conducive for them. So what means clean environment? Clean environment means that in terms of protection of investment, it is clear, you know? There is no doubt about it. Protection of investment, protection of investors. Bureaucracy is easy as well. You don't need to spend a lot of time to open a company or even some countries actually make you open a company very easily, but then you have to face all, all, the, all, all, all the issues and the challenges from the tax authorities. So tax is clean, clear, open, you know what to do. Trading, access to market must be as well easy, but then access as well to public procurement must be easy. Government is usually the biggest buyers in every economy, starting from the US where you go to China, you go to even developed countries. It's only government buy, buys. In Africa, entrepreneurs, they don't know how to access to public procurement opportunities because public procurement opportunities are not managed openly and clearly and transparently. You have to have a friend somewhere before you could access to that. So that's my uh, recommendation. And that's exactly the work that we are doing right now. Uh, number one, we are working with the UNEC, with the African Union Commission and the regional economic communities to address the issue of industrial policy, that's number one, but also to address the issue and the challenges of the business environment, number two, and then also pushing them actually to really think about making easy the access to public procurement opportunities to business. Without that, it can't actually change anything. Say, talking about diversification, it's just going to be another speech. Okay, thank you. And Henry, as an operator in the technology sector, would you like to react on uh, I mean, uh, co comments? Well, uh, in in what sense? Um, do you agree or do you want? Technology sector. Uh, I didn't catch you. Well, yeah. I mean, on a micro level, me, I'm more on a micro. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yes, okay, yes, great. Yeah, yeah. No, no, ab absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, there's huge gaps. And, I, and what I would add also is uh, in a lot of countries, we, we give red carpet to foreign technology and, and local technologies, they have to struggle uh, to find a market, you know. So uh, I, I totally agree uh, with Amin on a micro level. I'm more on a micro level. Uh, per se, when on the practicality of things on the ground. Um, but yeah, I mean, there has to be room. I, I always use this analogy of, of we, we, we need to pr protect our economy to a sense where we can become competitive with the rest of the world. And the only way we can do that is by promoting from the ground up locally. If we don't do that, then what's going to happen is we're going to still be participant to, to, uh, to, to to this uh, fourth industrial economy instead of, of being the actors. We're just gonna be, you know, uh, uh, just on the side, on the side uh, uh, note, just participating in this, um, in this fourth industrial economy. So yeah, there has to be structure put in place. And, and I mean, mention how fragmented the market is. Absolutely. You have some markets that are doing well, you have other markets that are not doing that well. And this fragmentation make it even more complex for companies like ours, for example, when we, when we, while we expanding, you know, we, we started our expansion last year and we've seen how complex uh, the, the, the expansion plan is. So uh, absolutely, I mean, I don't have anything added uh, besides my experience, but I totally agree with Amin on that, on that level. Okay, and uh, can you just tell me more about your company? How, how in one way or another you can assist during this pandemic? Because we talk about technology sector that can help uh, uh, during this uh, pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. So ARED is, a, is mostly a micro infrastructure solution. What we deal with, we, we bridge the digital gap, mostly for low income people. We deal with what we call the last mile connectivity, right? So we develop um, a solar kiosk platform with a mini server system uh, to allow or to facilitate access for low income people to participate in this digital uh, economy that has been that 70% of the population in Africa has just been left out. You know, uh, if you look at connectivity uh, in Africa, 
most of the investment goes with the big infrastructure, uh, the, the big cabling around the continent, the fiber to businesses, urban setting. But when you go beyond the, the, the urban setting, when you go to rural area, refugee camps, we also operate in refugee camps in Uganda. Um, there is a gap, there's a huge gap in connectivity access. The second problem that we're solving is digital literacy and the high cost of the internet. So even if you bring internet in those communities, you have to solve the, the cost of it, which is not there yet. Actually, some countries are taxing internet, looking for funding to, so they tax it, which is not helping the case. The second thing is digital literacy. You have 70% of the people never been connected to the internet. And we're trying to bring traditional mobile app solution to people that don't necessarily know what digital literacy is. And the last challenge is, uh, is um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, energy. You cannot talk about connectivity without energy. So our technology kind of solve all that into one. And we've been working on it for seven years now. We've been in market for seven years. We're in Rwanda, Uganda, Burkina Faso, and Africa Coast. And, uh, and, and yeah, so we are B2B business. We work mostly with uh, NGOs and telecom companies that use our technology um, uh, to bring the last mile connectivity. And, and last thing I would like to add is, so the idea we have is not just bridging the gap through internet, but this mini server that we develop, it's really how to uh, host some digital application locally. The big, one of the biggest problem we have in Africa is that most of the server that fuel this internet economy are hosted outside the continent. So we need to develop our own infrastructure. Um, and one of the, the most important part of the infrastructure of the internet is this cloud technology we're talking about. But in our case, we're building what we call a distributed uh, um, cloud solution uh, to minimize the cost of access. So this is pretty much what ARED is about. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me go back to Mr. Adum. Uh, we know that in general, uh, tra traditional banks are very cautious to finance uh, SMEs. Uh, how does your organization address financing gaps in Africa and uh, how African states can be encouraged to promote also alternative sources of finances for SMEs like uh, crowdfunding, uh, digital credit, pay, pay as you go, et cetera. Right, Th there are three points here. Uh, number one, the, the fact that traditional bankers are afraid of financing micro, small and medium enterprises, it has roots, it has actually reasons. I wouldn't say good or bad reasons, but the reasons are there and the reason basically are three. Number one, ninety-two percent of African micro, small, and medium enterprises are operating in the informal sector. So that means they have no financial statement, no accounting, no administrative organizations that you can trace, you can trace, and you can evaluate, you can assess. That makes you, as an entrepreneur, quite risky for any banker. That's number one. That's the reason. And uh, obviously, uh, because they are risky, banks would not necessarily agree to deal with them. Do bank actually open them accounts? So they, 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 they use those entrepreneurs, they use bank to receive their money and to run, the, to manage their business, but because they don't have financial system or they don't want to use financial systems, uh, at least the modern systems, because they will tell you, I'm afraid I'm going to pay too much taxes, you know? So it wouldn't work. So we have actually kick off a solution to that challenge. The solution actually have three steps. Let's say five steps to, tell you, to, to, to be quite thorough on that. First step, it is to educate micro, small, and medium enterprises to become more formal. More formal means at least they should agree to use standard operating procedures that are known, that you can trace, that you can assess, you can evaluate. It means at the end of financial year, for instance, or at the end of the month, after the month ends closure, banks, if they go to a bank, bank can actually assess their viability. 
And we have connected with bank, we have partners, and we are partnering with banks to be the ones to deliver this solution, this training, instead of asking just business schools or consultants. We want the banks actually to do that. Why? Because banks know exactly what they need, you know, from the entrepreneurs. So they should be the one helping us to sensitize. That's number one. Then moving them into more formal. Then when you close this gap, this gap of the informal, formal, you know, you, you have already addressed, let's say, 30 to 40% of the risk that MSME may represent. Now, there is still 60% of the risk. So how would you address the issue? We, we, we have seen for the last few years, let's say 10, 20 years, international finance, uh, development finance institutions, and also bilateral institutions, trying to finance MSMEs by giving them direct access to financing. It comes like a donation or cheap money. But it's the issue, the challenge is not the challenge of cheap money. You know, the challenge is companies need money for something. What do they need money for? Basically, they need money for working capital. You know, money for investment, for equity is one thing. But for day-to-day -day operation, they need money. If they go for a public procurement opportunity or another opportunity, they need money to finance this, uh, the, the solution they're going to, to finance this opportunity, which is working capital, basically. So we come with this solution, we tell bankers, that uh, let's, let's put in place a solution. We create a guarantee fund with the Africa Guarantee Fund, by the way, that can be managed regionally and then locally at the national level, you know, at the level of every bank, when MSMEs, put a request for financing after they have gone through the process of formalizing themselves, this guarantee mechanism can come, you know, to reduce the guarantee. So, and this is where governments come. We are telling governments that most of the African government during the COVID, they have pledged funds, money, millions, actually billions of dollars, you know, to say, let's take Nigeria, I have say, I'm going, I'm going to put like $10 billion. Kenya, $5 billion. Rwanda, a little bit less than a, uh, a billion dollars. So instead of going and distributing the money directly to, to MSMEs, we are encouraging them to put this money into the guarantee scheme. Why? Because when you go through, when you go via the guarantee, our studies and the, 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 the scheme that we are developing with the Africa Guarantee Fund show that for every dollar of investment into the guarantee fund, you can mobilize $7 of loan that can go to the MSMEs directly. So by encouraging governments to come into guarantee scheme, you know, you are helping them to increase actually their solution, the, the, the financing that they are going to provide to uh, MSMEs. So our solution is to say, it's not the role of government to invest into MSMEs or to provide money to MSMEs, it's the role of bank. Bankers are the ones, this is their job. Now, bank must be reassured, and there are three ways to reassure them. Number one, move, push, actually, MSMEs to formalize themselves. And number two, create a guarantee fund, guarantee mechanism that will reassure the bankers themselves. And obviously, bankers also must take some risk. The remaining risk must be actually, you know, for the bankers uh, themselves. That's one. Now, what do we do to encourage uh, governments to, 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 to open the market for, uh, alternative source of financing, again, that goes to upgrade, update our regulatory system. If you go to Central Africa region, for instance, I'm, I'm not about East Africa, but you go to, I will take the example of Central Africa uh, and West Africa, the, those countries that speak French, the 14 countries, they have a similar, they have only two central banks. So we say that must be, it must be easy actually to engage with them and to pilot this initiative, telling them, listen, uh, if the Central Bank of East of Central African countries and Central Bank of West African countries, you know, agree to upgrade the regulatory framework to, 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 to make actual life much easier for crowdfunding, for other sources of financing, at least in one regulatory short, you can address the issue for 14 countries. So that's the work we are doing with the regulators, sensitizing them. And we have bankers with us, by the way, because it's also an opportunity for bankers. It's just an opportunity for new financier to come on board, new investors to come. So we are doing this work with them, hoping that this year we can convince them to try this solution. And this solution can only be implemented if they agree 
to update the regulatory framework. Now, East Africa is different because Kenya is one of the most advanced country in that way. Rwanda as well is another quite advanced country, I would say, you know, in updating the regulatory. We, we are doing a follow up, encouraging governments to, to, to open their space. You know, once the space is open, uh, obviously investors can come. So that's the work we, we are doing. And let me summarize uh, three things here. Number one, formalizing the informal economy is key for uh, those MSMEs to access to financing. Number two, uh, pushing governments and international organizations who want to invest, to invest into guarantee funds. Guarantee scheme actually is the best way to, to, to multiply the access to financing. And then number three, working with government to help them and encourage them to address the issue of the regulatory framework to modernize it. So once it's modernized, you can now start talking about alternative sources of financing. Otherwise, we will talk and there is no solution. Thanks. Okay. No, well, thank you very much for this comprehensive explanation. I just want to go back to Henry and to ask him, as an actor operating in the private sector in Rwanda, uh, what would be your suggestions to solve yeah, these difficulties for MSMEs to access finance in general? So that, that's a good, that's an interesting point uh, that I, I actually talk a lot about it and I, I'll have to deviate a little bit what Amin is saying on that level. Um, and that's just for my experience. Again, I'm only speaking from my experience. We have raised money and what we found out is there's a bias when it comes to companies from Africa and companies from abroad doing business in Africa. Um, there's a bias, well, they, there's also a huge gap when it comes to uh, access to funding. Because for example, for ARED, 100% uh, of the fundraising we've done so far has been from front from Germany and the States, the, the US. We have unable, we, we, we never raise capital from Africa, from African entrepreneurial angel investors, as they call it, overseas. Um, and and I, I like to, I'm going to generalize a little bit, things change uh, from time to time. But, um, and the reason for me is mostly because a lot of local investors don't necessarily see value in tech companies yet compared to the West. Uh, they still want to focus on infrastructure business, hotel, big buildings, stuff like this. Uh, the, 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 the second thing is the biggest challenge for tech companies in Africa uh, or African tech companies is in valuation. Do you know that in the States, we value company based not just on revenue, but uh, they can use uh, the, the, the technology as, a, as, as part of the valuation, uh, the traction of having a user has some type of value. So there's different type of formula that you can use to raise capital. But when you deal with local investors, they strictly focus on revenue. So you know tech companies usually grow based on user base first and then monetize afterward. That's most of the tech companies. Um, now you can, you can change the FinTech might be a little bit different, but in general, this is how most tech company grow. Uh, they, they, they grow from user base and then revenue base. But now how do you value local company? I truly believe that VCs, banks, uh, government have a place and a role to play in this investment vehicle. But I think it's not enough. If you want to increase the frequency of the number of investment, we need to incorporate technology. Uh, one of the things we had to do, and I like to be open about that, we had to set up a structure in Delaware, in the States, to increase or to, to, to entice investors much more easily. But I truly believe that the, 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 the tech infrastructure that's gonna be a game changer is what we call crowd investing or equity investing using crowd. Uh, platform, which can increase dramatically the number of startup that can be invested upon and using, for example, diaspora to invest in companies. And instead of looking for tickets of 100,000 plus, now you can deal with thousands and thousands of people that give a ticket of $500, $1,000. <clears> they have less to lose and they can increase they can invest in multiple com companies at once. That infrastructure already exists in the States and in Europe. 
unfortunately in Africa, we're not there yet. The, the, the rules, the laws are not, uh, I, I, there haven't been laws yet to develop those kind of, of solution to allow uh, uh, um, individuals, diaspora or local individual to participate in a crowd investing platform to invest and get some type of incentive and gaps and all that. So those are the things I believe will need to change because without capital, and I want to be clear about that, without capital, we are not going to win this game. And I'm talking about we, I'm talking about African entrepreneur, whether it's in tech, agribusiness, whatever you want to call it. We're not going to win this war because we're competing with companies that can raise 20, 30, uh, $40 million. And I'll end with this because we're also in the energy sector. I mean, we have an energy component. If you look at the energy sector, out of all the energy companies doing business in Africa, only 3% of those companies are African-owned. 3% are African-owned. That just tell you how dramatic and, 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 and problematic this, this issue is in all level of the, the economy. Hello? Yeah, well, sorry, I was done. I was done. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much, Henry. I think that Cedric is having some connection issues. He will be joining us uh, again once he will be able to fix that. Uh, waiting for Cedric to be back, we can uh, take some of the questions that we got from the audience. Okay, so Cedric is here. We can take a first question while he gets connected and settled. Uh, so uh, the question that we got is about research and development. Um, what role for African made R&D to sustain African industry in this new era we are getting to, knowing that the continent is much more consumer of innovation rather than a producer? What's your reflection about it? How, how can we answer this question of research and development, which is uh, key to the development of industry and manufacturing? Maybe, I think, I can, I can comment on that one. And it's pretty much linked to the comments from uh, Henri on, on the need for, for capital. And I think I'm pleased to, to, to tell you, Henri, that uh, we, we are right now working on a solution for the crowd investment, you know, uh, which is a solution that we are developing with a few of our partners. We have engaged actually partners again from uh, outside the continent, German partners, but also American partners, <laughs> basically, to work on this uh, platform and hopefully before the end of the year, would be able to release it, you know, to the African uh, entrepreneurs uh, to, to, to really look for uh, investment, especially use, use technology to, to raise uh, capital. Uh, we understand that there may be some uh, some 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 regulatory uh, challenges here and there, but we are pretty sure that because we are the Continental Development Organization, we would be able actually to overcome those uh, challenges and avail this uh, platform, the pretty similar platform, I would say, but a little bit more Africanized, you know, that actually integrate our reality and our challenges. You know, and provide this uh, solution so African entrepreneurs can raise uh, money utilizing this uh, platform. You know, it's, it's critical. We have noted this challenge of access to capital and we are very much aware that uh, usually when you go, uh, it's not just the case for big African companies, but not just the case for small African companies, but even big African companies, if you go to a financing institution and you compete, let's say, with another international uh, company, you have very little chance actually to get access to money. And that goes a lot. It has a lot to do with the risk that, or the perception of risk that actually Africa gives, you know, at the international level. And don't forget as well that the majority of the banks operating in this continent are foreign banks as well. They are not African banks. The same like for the energy sector, 3% of them only are Africans. If you go to the financial institutions, uh, apart from few banks, the majority of them are coming from abroad. And obviously, they are here to make money, but they are not necessarily here to invest 
you know, for our companies to make money, you know. So uh, there is a case here and it's our role to make sure that <laughs> we, we overcome this, this challenge. So solution is on the way. And I'm pretty sure that we we'll definitely will have to talk with you and also learn from your challenge and make sure that your challenge actually will be utilized as lessons learned for us to provide the best uh, solution you know, for African entrepreneurs. Now, going back to the question of R&D in Africa, again, research and development uh, require capital. You know, it's the same problem, unless we, we th there is one challenge that I see here in this continent. We usually, when we see a very little uh, innovation, we like to brag about it. You know, it's good, it's encouraging, but that's not enough. You really need serious research. And for serious research, research actually to provide solution, you need serious investment. But you need as well, the, 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 the government infrastructure, I would say, must be, as well, uh, must be as well updated and upgraded to support. Let's take the case and let me just share with you few numbers, few statistics. 2014, no, sorry, 2018, there have been around the world like 3.5 million patents in the world. If you look at the number of patents that was, were registered from Africa, I think it's less than 20,000 patents. The majority of the patents are coming from South Africa, Morocco, you know, that those are the majority of the patents. I think South Africa alone accounts for, let's say like 7,000 patents, Morocco for two, 3,000 patents, I think. And the remaining are shared by most of the African countries. Now, does it mean that African uh, are not innovative enough? No, we are innovative. But the fact is Morocco and South Africa and Kenya and a few other countries are the ones that have established bureau, uh, patent bureau, you know, that are known, that work, that operate. So it's easy for inventors and innovators to go and to register the patents there. The other countries, even if they have an office from the WPO, World Patent Organization, International Intellectual Property Organization from the UN, they may have an office there. The offices are not known. Government office may be there as well, but they are dysfunctional. And if you go there to register a patent, it's a problem. But then it costs as well money, you know, so before talking about actually making sure that innovation help, we need to push governments to structure themselves to support innovation, to support research and development. You know, just at the level of registration first, don't even go at the level of research. You know, so, and that's the work African Union is trying to do, but are we successful? Are we succeeding? I don't think that we are succeeding uh, here again. Why? Maybe because most of us are civil servants, and we have no idea about what private sector does and how private sector works, let's say, you know. So there is a challenge here, but for us to overcome this challenge, I think we need to support from the private sector. We also need people, invest, uh, inventors to make noise. Unfortunately, right now, the only noise African people we, we make is noise about politics. Okay, maybe politics is, is the root cause, right? <laughs> we understand. But let's have as well innovators uh, people investing in this sector to organize themselves and to make noise so we can address this issue of patent registration. Otherwise, uh, and th this, this is actually, it's quite interesting because I have been analyzing the numbers since 2010, before even I came into African Union Development Agency. When I was working in the private sector as a senior executive, I was really very much interested and I have been following these statistics year on year. Nothing is changing. The only thing, maybe there is Small change is Morocco. Morocco wasn't there before among the top five. But then suddenly for the last five years, we see Morocco actually increasing, increasing. So people need to learn from what Morocco is doing. Why we have more patent registration from Morocco and the other countries are stuck. You see Cote d'Ivoire or you can see Senegal or Kenya coming just a year randomly. They come randomly. The only countries where you see there is an increase, an organic increase, organic growth, are the two, South Africa and Morocco. There is something that we can learn from them. No. Thanks. Okay. And, and if I, sorry, Cedric, I, I just want to add quickly, because I'm laughing because 
I mean, touch through a very interesting point because we did apply for a patent in Rwanda um, that cost us uh, an arm and a leg just for one country, right? Uh, you know, hiring lawyers and all those things. And yeah, we've, we've group, uh, we have the Western, uh, I mean, Eastern Africa, Western African groups and all, but there's no centralized uh, system. There's no, some of them are digital, some of them are not. So it's very interesting, I mean, what he's mentioning. But I do want to say also, uh, it's not just on the patent side, but the legal side also. Because you can have a patent and somebody copy you, you still have to get a, a, a legal team to, to protect your patent. So the legal framework also is not there. It's not strong enough. You know, you can get copy and, and get lost in, in, in litigation for years and years. So uh, there, there is a lot of change. But I want to talk about R&D because we spent five and a half years developing our technology. 80% of the fund we raised was grant. And you know where those grants came from? Germany and the U.S. To develop, for, uh, for an African entrepreneur to develop a solution for Africa. Do you think I found any grants in Africa? Zero, nothing. No, you know, couldn't find anything because there's no grant program. Most of those grant programs in Africa are funded by Western country. We're not budgeting grant project in, in Africa. Most of the grants are for big projects and all, but for startups, innovation, it's just on the back burner. So I think the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems of Africa, we need to change our mindset. You know, we, we know we're no longer playing. We, we, we need to understand that we, we're playing, uh, we, we're part of this big game or ecosystem that is, that is called the world. And it, it, we need to understand that this is a competition. We cannot, you know, just think that, when a company come from outside bringing a solution in Africa, they're just here to help us. No, they're here to generate revenue, make money and bring that money back to where they're from most of the time. So we need to understand those things. We need to change our mindset. And I think one of the biggest challenges also, we don't work well together. I've seen our, our startup ecosystem, everybody doing their own thing. We don't share information. We, we, we don't help each other. And I, I'm hopeful for the next generation, but for our generation, I mean, it, it's just sad. So all those gaps uh, I see, it, it, it really, it, it's really concerning to me because I shouldn't be the only uh, solar kiosk platform on the, on, on the continent or in East Africa. There should be several of us. You know, there, there shouldn't be just one company. We should be, a, uh, there should be a bunch of company in the solar business, in the energy, uh, in, a, in a connectivity space and all those things. And so far, at least the way things are, we are losing the game. But I am optimistic for the future, for sure. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. That was really insightful. And uh, so in the same vein, so you don't think, uh, Henry, that uh, a Silicon Valley model of entrepreneurship will work in Africa? <laughs> no, it, it, we need to stop this copy-paste business. This is what Africa is very good at, copy-paste. We see something outside, we want to copy. The problematic in Africa is different. We have other problems that we need to worry about. We need to develop the ecosystem, first of all, before we talk about Silicon Valley. We need to develop a strong local ecosystem, uh, you know, a Pan-African ecosystem. Uh, we need to change the way we raise capital also. Uh, so all that, we, it has to be, it has to be a, a, a bottom-up approach, not this copy and paste business. So to answer, the short answer is no, hell no. I think, if I may, actually, uh, I 100% agree with Henry. We don't need a Silicon Valley, an African Silicon Valley. Maybe we need the Omo Valley, you know, something like that, uh, or the Victoria Lake Valley, whatever. But something that really fit, uh, that, that will respond to our needs. So when you talk about innovation so far, and I would like to conclude here, uh, every I have seen on the internet uh, people bragging because somebody have assembled a cell phone in Rwanda, you know, and we say, "Wow, that's an innovation! That's absolutely an innovation! That's a copy paste." Whether you do it in Lagos or in Kigali or in Abidjan, copy paste is good. Maybe we learn from copying, you know, and pasting. But then at one stage, we need now to move ahead. So what we need, number one, really is to create the environment. And creating this environment, again, goes back to government. It's government responsibilities. 
first because an individual cannot create an environment. A company cannot create an environment. Creating this environment, this enabling environment is the role of government. Thanks God, we can see some governments are trying. So let's assume that they would continue pushing so we can actually create this environment. Creating this environment will make actually financier as well feeling safe. Today, uh, the reason why African investors don't invest into our startup, into technology, it is because they see everything being done in Africa risky. And as an example, even African pension funds, they don't invest in Africa. They prefer actually to go and invest in the US and in France, in Europe. That Africa pension funds, government pension fund, by the way, you know, prefer to invest in Europe because it's safer, right? Because their own continent is quite risky. And to give you just an example, when I was at the African Union Commission, we we're trying to push to get an African, an African pension fund to manage the African Union pension fund. And the staff said, no, we don't want it. So look at those people paid by African governments. You know, their own pension coming from African taxpayers. They don't want this pension fund to be managed by African pension fund manager, but rather to be managed by an American pension fund because they trust the American pension fund. Now, I can't blame them. It is the environment that need to be, that have to be blamed because the environment is quite risky, even for our own civil servants. They prefer to keep their savings abroad. That's a message for governments. You know, at the African Union itself, where the African Union workers prefer to see their own savings to be managed by a foreign company. And the African Union is supposed to be the one working to make this continent a better place, a safer place. So look at the contradiction. But then you go back actually at the country. So I think if there is a message to be sent, the message is for governments, not only for the African Union, but for our governments to make sure that our countries are safer. When the countries are safer, usually investors will come and our own investors will accept to invest for long-term investment. Why do you go to hotel? Because hotel is a short-term investment. In fact, Henry, your investment is a long-term investment. It's quite risky for any African because you don't know what is the government going to be there tomorrow or not. You see? All right. Thank you very much. On that note, uh, because of time, because it's so passionate that we can go on, <laughs> on and on and on. Uh, I just want to check if we have any other questions from the participants. Uh, maybe Khadija can help me. Yes, sure, Cedric. I think that we have got two more questions. Um, the first one is, are classical incentives like taxation and access to land still good carrots to encourage investment in industry? Otherwise, what types of incentives or environments are investors looking for to encourage, uh, to encourage investment in manufacturing projects? So that's the first question. And the second one is how and I could link this to uh, Henry's uh, last comments. How will the uh, free tra trade zone agreement uh, impact the industrialization of the region? Should we expect short term results? And this may be links to his comments about the fact that you are, we do not have any uh, common or shared resources or tactics or strategies. Each region maybe is working alone, but no uh, uh, communication, no common ground, common, uh, 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 let's say, perspectives between the whole continent. So these are the two questions that we have still in the queue of Q&A. Thank you. So who wants to answer the questions? <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, Khadija, you can repeat the first question and because I couldn't really get it. Yes, yes, of course, sure, sure. So the first question was about the incentives. Uh, are classical incentives like taxation and access to land still good carrots to encourage investment in industry? Uh, 
otherwise, what types of investment, uh, in, uh, sorry, incentives or environments are investors looking for in order to be encouraged to invest in manufacturing? Uh, I think what the person means by, by incentives, it's all the uh, uh, what, what the governments offer to investors who would like to create uh, uh, industries, manufacturers, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the specific taxation programs uh, or the facilities to access land with a symbolic price, these kind of traditional incentives, let's say. All right, I think if you, if, you, if you look at most of the foreign direct investment in the continent for the last 20 years, the majority of them are going into oil and gas and mining. And there is a reason for that. And number one, because uh, those are quite a heavy capital uh, investment, but there are guarantees, you know, from the government themselves, but also because the, the, the results or if you can, the returns are kind of cash cow. So easy, big corporations for them to come and to invest because governments make everything possible to please them. When you invest into, let's say, normal industry, you know, uh, food plant, or let's say an assembly plant for a phone, something like that, which can also require capital, but at the same time, uh, it wouldn't actually turn out to be, to become a cash cow, you will start facing problems. So obviously, as an investor, you wouldn't necessarily receive support from government or when you receive support from government, it's not as heavy support as the one that is provided to mining and oil companies or big agri, agri business firms, I would say. So it's quite difficult uh, for you. So again, my response would go back to what I've said previously. It's really about the government to create the environment and this environment that will be conducive for doing business. You know, it can be conducive for doing business at the micro level, small level, or medium uh, level. Then otherwise, just providing land, you know, or tax incentive will not be enough. In fact, there are many countries that are ready to provide, not necessarily free land, but some kind of ac easy access to land. And easy, they have ease as well, the regulatory, especially tax system, you know, uh, where people are being exonerated somehow from taxes for a few years, but still people are not coming. Why? Because the environment is not conducive. You may come, you may put your money, or you may not be able, even if you want to come, to mobilize enough investors to accompany you, to raise capital, to raise equity. You know? So response, go back again. Let's make sure that governments create the environment, a conducive environment for investors to come and to feel safe. I was traveling one day and in the plane, I was with, sitting next to somebody who invests heavily in few countries only in the continent. Then I asked him, why don't you invest there? I said, I will invest there the day I can sue the government and I will win, you know, the, the trial at the court. Otherwise, I wouldn't go there. So the response is clear. It's not about incentive. It's about making sure that the environment is safe enough for any investor to come without having to, to go, you know, through friends or through relationship. If in your country, we have to use networking and relationship, you know, before to invest, that means there is a problem. And I wouldn't go even myself as an, I, I do investment, you know, because when you use your savings, you can invest into, into the market, you know, but it, it has, the environment must be safe first. So otherwise everything else is just theory. So I cannot even talk about incentive. The first and most important incentive is the environment. Make it safe for investors. Thank you, Amin. Uh, Henry, you want to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I just want to add, I, I agree with Amin, but I just want to, I mean, as an entrepreneur, I look at risk as an asset, not a liability, right? Because I believe that when you, when you enter a market and you among the first one, you have a much bigger opportunity to dominate that industry, wherever, whatever that industry is. So it's also about how you look at things. But, you know, um, investment is really a, a, a personal 
uh, uh, issues. Some people like risk and they come in, some others don't, but, but I agree with, I mean, also you, we have to bring some stability investors, at least long-term investors don't like to see, you know, a lot of fric friction politically and all those things. But I think just like any continent or any country, we have to start somewhere. Uh, any, there is no continent that started from the top. They have to start somewhere. And that's where Africa is. I don't, I, don't, I don't think Africa is at ground zero. I think we passed that stage, but I think there's still a lot to be learned. But I still believe that the, the companies that are gonna start today in a different industry will be the one that dominates tomorrow for sure. As long as they don't quit and keep pushing. Yeah, and maybe to add on what Henry has said, if you look at actually East Africa today, uh, some of the countries, uh, let's take like Rwanda or Kenya or Tanzania or even Ethiopia, some time ago, they were perceived as quite stable. You know? So they have been able to attract foreign direct investments, but also to increase you know, the domestic uh, investment. So definitely risk is part of business. But to manage risk, you need to, because it's not every risk, complex risk can be managed, but complicated risk cannot be managed. So business actually are ready to deal with complexity, but they can manage complications, right? So what I'm talking about is complication. It's not about complexity. So if you ease and you make the environment conducive, investors will come and they will take the risk and they will manage it properly. It's part of the game. You know? But complication is something that in Africa we like creating and our advice as development agency to most of the African governments is please kill complication. Just leave the complexity. People will be able to manage the complexity. Thank you very much. On that note, that was the, the conclusion of our, of our webinar. Uh, just to add more, I just want to, yeah, to summarize that COVID-19 has underlined Africa's reliance on external supply chains and, relati and relatively weak uh, health systems. But Africa needs to deploy more effort towards achieving its industrialization goal. Although we talk about East Africa, the region is fragmented. Each country, as say Henry, has its own specific challenges. And to resolve some of the weaknesses exposed by uh, the pandemic, there is a need for increased focus on homegrown solutions as a means to tackle development challenges on the continent. Uh, in every crisis, there are opportunities. So leveraging digital technology can contribute significantly to that purpose. Uh, government, as say I mean, must create an enabling environment to encourage innovation and industrializations, and above all, a safe business. Uh, Africa must trust Africa, in, in one word. So thank you very much for uh, participating to our webinar. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you, Amin. Uh, thank you, Khadija. I don't know if you have a last word before we close. I would just like to say thank you again for the speakers and thank you for the participants. Thank you very much for having enriched this debate and looking forward to meeting you in person in the upcoming session of IFRAN Forum. We are planning our next edition uh, by the end of 2021. That would be the occasion to uh, visit Morocco. But yet, I mean, I hear you when you talk about R&D within Morocco. It's definitely something that the government has been working on and many uh, operators uh, also invest in, be it universities uh, or uh, uh, large industries. So yes, thank you very much again and looking forward to meeting you in person very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.